and press record. So we are now recording. Um, so just starting off with a little bit of housekeeping as folks are joining us. Um, please mute yourself when you're not talking. Uh, I don't, I think we muted everyone on, on entry. So, um, you know, just make sure to mute yourself when, when it's not you on the screen. Um, Karen is going to uh, find some moments when she may um, ask questions of the group. We'll mostly be using the chat for that, but occasionally we may ask that you unmute yourself. Um, and you can do that by either pressing the unmute button on the bottom of Zoom, or if you're on your phone, you can press star six. So that's the muting. Um, other housekeeping, um, if you, uh, our protocol is if for whatever reason you get booted out, just dial back in the same way that you got here. <laughs> so that's the protocol and we'll just keep going. Um, let's see, if you would like to use the chat feature and it's not turned on, you can press the chat button at the bottom of your screen if you mouse over it. Um, sometimes you need to, if your Zoom screen is maximized, you might want to restore it down to um, where it's not your full screen, you should see the chat function show up. You can chat with everyone, or if you have any technical difficulties during, um, please just switch the everyone to Lauren Green and let me know privately and I'll, and I'll work through to troubleshoot that with you. So thanks everyone who's chatting in right now and letting us know that you're here. That's excellent. It's nice to have the, the, club, the community even though we're virtual. Um, let's see, if you want to click around and stalk Mateo while you are on this video screen, you can do so by scrolling across the videos at the top of your screen. You can see everybody else who's on the call. <laughs> Hi, Mateo. I always do that to you. <laughs> uh, but mainly we're, mainly we're going to be watching Karen um, and her slides. So um, Karen's video should be pinned. Um, so we will we'll stick with that. So feel free to stalk your neighbors. Um, let's see. Do, do, do we'll be keeping an eye on the chat. And if, if at any point there's a question we're not sure of, um, we may throw it back to the group or we'll get back to you on that. The webinar tonight will be will run our 90 minutes, so till about nine o'clock. We may we may go over some for some questions though. So if you have a question and um, there's a lot of content to get through and we can't get to it during this session. Um, you can always stay on past nine and, and Karen is being very generous with her time and we can have other discussion. So let's see. Um, other things, if you are new to Nova Scribes, why don't you go ahead and chat. Anyone new? Anyone this your first Nova Scribes ever? Any newbies? Just chat in. So if you're if you're new, Nova Scribes, um, we're primarily based in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area. We're an open forum for visual practitioners to share knowledge. Anyone who uses visuals to move others, graphic facilitators, recorders, scribes, sketch editors, video scribers, UX designers, and visual consultants. Uh, we have organized cl classes, graphic jams, open spaces, and now webinars. So it hasn't been posted yet, but you can save the date. Our next, uh, our next event is going to be on May 17th, and there's another one on June 21st. Um, the May 17th one will be an in-person session, um, most likely in Chantilly, Virginia. We'll post that location, and it'll be on systems thinking for visual practitioners. And then if you look on June 21st, um, there is a session on, uh, Brian, chime in and, and unmute yourself and tell us what the June 21st session is. Yeah, hang on just a second. Let me grab my calendar to make sure I've got the date right. Stand by. Okay, so we'll, we'll come back. There's one on June 21st. Uh, and you can check that out on the... You got it or should I move forward? I got it. Hang on a second. So actually, um, we're having a special day. This one I'm very, very excited about. Uh, and I just want to make sure that I've got the date exactly, exactly right. So Lauren had said <coughs> that the uh, the, the next one was going to be on systems thinking. And uh, what's the date on that one again, Lauren? Uh, so that one's going to be on Thursday, May 17th. And thank you. You're, I think you're going to talk about the May 24th one. So that's great. Yeah, so the May 24th one. So this one is really exciting. Um, we were able to get Lori Durnell, uh, who's the co-president of the Grove Consultants, to introduce um, the Grove's model for visual teaming. This is the Drexler Sibit. So this is a really big deal, guys. This is one of the most, uh, this is one of the biggest 
uh, models inside the, the field of visual practitioner. So if you can attend that one, um, we're just getting kind of the, um, uh, the uh, we're just getting started planning this one, but it's going to be from 630 to 8 o'clock at night, uh, and she's only charging $15 for it. Um, and it's it's a real rare opportunity. She has never presented this before in a webinar, so if you can make this one, this, this is one not to miss. Excellent. And I will post, I'm going to put the link to our other meetups in the chat, so after the session you can go check that out. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Karen. Uh, normally I would give her a very flowery introduction, but she's going to introduce herself. So all, uh, all I will say is she's gen gen generously um, donated her time um, and put together a lot of these materials, or she's put together these materials for us, particularly with this group in mind, and we're very appreciative of her taking the time to, to do this. So thank you, Karen. I'll pass it over to you. Well, thank you, Lauren, and uh, I appreciate Lauren not only for setting us up tonight, but for all the extensive work she has done behind the scenes to make our time possible. As she said, I will give you a brief intro on myself, but I'd rather start by talking about you. Uh, I am so excited about the group that has come together tonight. We have such a wonderful range of experiences and skills. We have people ranging from new to graphic recording, to people who are doing strategic planning within organizations, to other people who are experienced in strategic planning with visual facilitation. So we have a whole range, and I look forward to hearing from you all tonight, uh, initially through the chat, but also in some of our discussion. To start us off with the chat, because we have a big group and a lot to cover, we're not going to do our usual go around and have people um, introduce themselves. But if you might just take a moment uh, in the chat in the next minute or two and just maybe give a sentence on who you're with or what you do or something about what you're hoping to get out of tonight, we'll kind of get that chat rolling uh, and get to, get to hear from some of the wonderful and diverse folks that we have. So please chat to everyone and just uh, tell us a little bit uh, about who you are and why you're here, just in a phrase or two, please. And Karen, let me know if you would like me to read out some of the chats. Uh, I'm curious why I'm not seeing more. Hang on, I'd like to be seeing them. If you... Oh, okay, here we go. Yeah. Here we go. Oh, fantastic. Angie from Flagstaff. Wonderful. Planning and Visioning. And, and Avra, excuse me if I'm mispronouncing that. Association for Talent Development. Wonderful. Yes, Paula. Very happy to see you again. All right, these will keep coming in, and I do encourage you to multitask uh, within our, our, our work together to listen to me, but also check the chat. I'd actually encourage you not to multitask to other things because we'll keep you pretty busy here. Let's go ahead and talk about our agenda for tonight. There we go. We're uh, going to, in addition to just introducing the session, we're going to start with some overview on what is strategic planning, why would you use it, et cetera. We're going to spend the bulk of our time looking at components of strategic planning that I have used for many, many years and simple visual approaches that you can use to incorporate them in your work. We'll spend a little time talking about the process of developing a strategic planning project, whether that's with clients or in your own organization. And uh, time permitting, we'll uh, briefly touch on some next steps. I encourage you to think about to think about tonight as a buffet. I have loaded up the buffet table with far more than we can possibly get to. So our goal for tonight is for this to be the first pass of the buffet. Some of the things you're going to sample and have a chance to enjoy. Some of them I'm going to tell you a little bit about and others I'm just going to point to. And because we have such a variety of backgrounds, your next round of the buffet after this call is going to be very different. We're going to have some experienced practitioners who are going to want to pick and choose a bunch of these things and start implementing. We have other people who are just going to want to maybe say, I want to learn these one or two tools and that's enough for me for now. We may have people who are focusing on project design internally. So I encourage you to think about as you go, what most resonates with you 
and do not try to take it all in. For us to eat the whole buffet, we would need the whole day and you'd all get really sick. Um, so, and please try to avoid becoming overwhelmed of, oh my gosh, look at all these things. It, we are not trying to um, give you my entire 20 plus years of strategic planning experience in an hour and a half, although I did try to do that when I designed the presentation. So you will forgive me for that. All right, so as I, I was starting to allude to, uh, I have over 20 uh, plus years of strategic planning experience. My background is business. I have an MBA. I have been group, uh, group vice president, strategic ma planning manager for a bank. I was a strategic uh, strategy director for Freddie Mac, but I have been self-employed since the mid nineties and done quite a bit of nonprofit strategic planning for nonprofits and businesses. Uh, my bent is analytical and quantitative, and we'll touch on that a little bit uh, tonight as you see what's going on. This is my take on strategic planning. It overlaps with a lot of things you will see elsewhere, but I like to say there's as many approaches and, and uh, definitions of strategic planning as there are consultants who want to work with you on a project. So uh, keep that in mind. I don't present this as the definitive be all end all. Uh, but even with all the variety, really at the end of the day, strategic planning boils down to four points. Where are you? Where do you want to go? How will you get there? And how will you stay on track? And most planning processes are pretty good at the where do you want to go and how will you get there? Uh, but we'll spend actually a fair amount of time tonight on the where are you part, which in my experience is really critical to the very best results for the organization. And we'll also touch on how will you stay on track, which is almost equally important, uh, but just in the interest of time, we won't have a ton of time there. So this is our framework. Uh, this is where we're going to be going. And now we're going to deep dive into each of these pieces one at a time. Where would you offer strategic planning within uh, a clientele or an organization? You can work with organizations as a whole. And as you can see, it's the complete gamut of types of organizations. You can work with units, subsidiaries, divisions, uh, departments. We had somebody who was participating tonight who was involved with committees, all great places to use strategic planning. So what you're going to learn tonight is also going to be applicable if you are looking at planning a product, a service, a program, a campaign. You will start to overlap with design thinking some there, but I think you'll see some things tonight that aren't part of design thinking, that those two approaches are complementary. They are not one or the other. So why would you do strategic planning? Well, the purpose of strategic planning is that in our, we're also caught in the, in the minutia and the detail and the next deadline. The planning helps us take a big picture perspective that we may not have all the time. It lets us look longer term versus just the day in and day out. It helps create a shared understanding. A lot of time we have people working at cross purposes and organizations because we understand the world differently and planning is a good time to, um, to bring that together. Finally, it's also a good opportunity to look outside the organization and look at external factors, which again, we can become really internally focused and be losing sight of what's going on. So that, uh, uh, sorry, I'm getting some different reactions from my computer than I'm expecting here. So that and uh, are, are the key factors that we have here. Now, that said, there are knocks on strategic planning. People say it's too structured and rigid and it's not responsive. I've seen comments that it's not enough about delivering value. A lot of times we talk about the strategic plan that sits on the shelf. Those are really examples of strategic planning gone bad. And I'm hoping tonight you'll see some things to help you think about how do we avoid those kinds of situations. Um, despite the fact that strategic planning, you know, sometimes does get some knocks and there are legitimate criticisms, lots and lots of organizations are still doing strategic planning and still benefiting from it. Okay, so that was sort of our overview and our introduction. Now we're going to spend the bulk of our time on components that you can consider in designing your strategic planning process. So as I mentioned, I really want to start with the issue around where are you? Because let's think of this. If we decided I want to go to Disney World, it would make a pretty big difference if you're coming from Tampa, Florida, or you're coming from Paris, France. So really understanding where you are and what's happening in the world around you lets you make the very best decisions 
for your organization. And to do that, our components include looking at the environment, the world around you, looking at your market or customers or stakeholders. You know, we're spanning business and nonprofits here, so I'm going to kind of jump back and forth on terminology, but um, it, it really applies in both situations. You want to look at your industry or competition, or if you're with a nonprofit that doesn't like those terms, you can talk about your field or alternatives or other organizations, but we need to look beyond ourselves. And then of course you look at your organization itself. Go right after them. One of the ways to have a really robust strategic planning process is for there to be preparation before people come into the room. The value of a good strategic planning process is you tap people's expertise and their judgment and their creativity. And that is only enhanced by people having the facts and the information that they can use as a springboard to make the best decisions. So the kinds of things that you might want to work with your organization or your clients to have before you get in a room are things like some research on what are the current trends? What's happening in the environment? What's happening with our stakeholders? What's going on with our competition? Uh, if there are surveys that talk about how people think about the work you do or your organization or your client's organization uh, or, or interviews. I've done a lot of projects where I, I come from a quant business background, so I often do the surveys or do interviews to try to understand the position of a company. Some of you would want to do that. You would have those skills. Um, others, you don't want to touch that with a 10-foot pole, and that's fine, but you might suggest your client do it with either internal or other resources to get a background on where they are. Um, to illustrate the, uh, the reason for that or the benefit, I'd like to um, uh, ask you for a moment. I'm involved with a group called Jewish Veg. Just like it sounds, it's a group that advocates plant-based, vegan, vegetarian eating to Jews. It's a very interesting little niche nonprofit. And so what I'd like to ask is that just hearing from people for a moment, if you were going to be with an organization like that, and you might be thinking about the kind of programs they might do or the kind of outreach they might do, what are some things that come to mind? And there's no right or wrong answer, and I have intentionally given you zero information, so, so you should not expect to have a fabulous answer with zero background. So i just love to hear from folks. If you can uh, unmute yourself for a moment, if you can um, answer or like just share something with either unmute or star six, let's just hear from a few people. What, you know, in the absence of information, what are some things you might think about doing to market veganism and vegetarianism to Jews? You have a, a couple via the chat. Um, oh, fantastic. This, uh, got cooking classes, gardening, educational programs in schools or a couple of the awesome. chat. Awesome. Great ideas. What else? Any other thoughts either via chat? Where are the interests? Exactly. Does anyone really like to filter fish anyway? I don't think so. How are relations Jewish holidays, gardening, synagogues? Okay, these are all fantastic ideas because we have a smart group of creative people here. So what I want to show you is some information that I put together for um, our last strategic planning meeting. Um, and this is just some excerpts because I didn't want to bury you. Uh, this is visually not an attractive piece, but I was buried in data work and didn't have time to pretty it up as part of it. Um, because one of the things the organization does quite a bit of is they do a lot of outreach through synagogues and they do a lot of work talking about sort of the Torah and the Bible and how that supports plant-based eating. And in fact, I've even done an infographic for them uh, putting that out there. Um, but one of the things that uh, we looked at is uh, in the Pew data, um, the Pew nonprofit has a lot of religious-based stuff that if you look at Jews, 10% are Orthodox, the most observant, you know, kind of like your evangelicals, and 90% are not. And so if you look to the left, the 10% that are the Orthodox, the religion is very important and they're very into Jewish law and they go to religious services. But if you look at the other 90%, they're not like that. Um, the religious part is less important. Um, the identity is, the culture is, and observing law is not really part of what they're into. 
And if you look down at the for Jews overall, which combines the two groups, you can see that things like leading an ethical and moral life, working for justice and equality, these are much bigger factors uh, for Jews than are, you know, viewing the, you know, the, the, the Torah as something I should live by and observing the law. So by looking at the data, we had some really good conversations to say, if we're going to be really heavy on marketing around the Bible and, and the Torah and things like that, that's appealing to a pretty select segment. And that's an okay strategic choice to make, but we need to be really conscious of that if we don't want to do it. And really the decision was more to, to shift away, to do some of that, but to make sure we're also continuing and, ex and expanding the, um, the, the, uh, the secular, the more secular or less religious outreach. So of all the fabulous ideas we have here, all of them have potential, but if you tie it to some data of who are the people you're really trying to, to work with, you get some pretty good insight on how you might be even more effective. So this is why I would really encourage you to try to either yourself or with your clients, try to bring some data to bear. And it does give you an opportunity as uh, visual people, for those of you who are, that you can do some interesting studio work. So this was uh, a bunch of interviews that I did for an organization. Um, this is intentionally blurred for confidentiality, but this was a big visual that I created up front so that we could bring this in and have things summarized. And I think it was a lot more fun and interesting than the typical market research report or PowerPoint presentation. So uh, data helps with decision making and you do have visual things you can do uh, as crummy as the one I showed you I did for Jewish Veg or, or something more like this or even nicer with the talents of some of the folks on this call. All right, so as you're getting into uh, data and planning, we talked about the environment, the context in which you're working. Uh, Brian mentioned the Grove. Uh, that particular upcoming session is more around teams, but the Grove is well known for their work-in strategy, and they offer a number of templates that you can use uh, with groups. For those of you who are coming with a strategic planning background, but not a visual background, this is a fabulous place for you to start. You don't have to draw anything. You can order the templates, uh, you can walk through, fill them in, and this is a great way to bring visuals into a discussion. As we look from a process standpoint, again, if some work has been done before the meeting about things you see here like technology, like trends, like political factors, that can enhance the quality. You can also use breakout groups if you have a large group. Maybe you have a group talk about technology for a while and another group is going to talk about the economic climate and then you come back together. So there are different ways to manage it process-wise, but this is really your biggest of the big picture of what's happening in the world. Uh, it doesn't have to be quite as complicated, or, or uh, co complicated is the wrong word, complex or uh, attractive as the Grove. This was a very simple environmental template that I did um, several years ago when I was actually working with a couple of leaders of a, of a tiny nonprofit. And all it was was laying out some, uh, some different aspects of the environment, the social, the technology, economic and political. I gave them instructions and questions. And this was actually a really low budget project. So I basically put these templates together. They worked on them for a week. We would come back, I would review the results, we would move on. So again, something really simple that you can do with groups, really simple template. Uh, that you could you could put together to get people going. I'm not going to go through the detail here. You have this in the slides. If this is something of interest to you, you can come back and look at it. Um, and I'll make the comment now because we'll be breezing through things pretty quickly. I definitely invite any of you after the session, if there's something that interested you that we kind of went through and you have a question, you want to talk for 10, 15 minutes to say, hey, could you explain that better? I didn't get it. How could I use that in my situation? You'll have all my contact information at the end and, and I'm happy to help. Um, I'm really passionate about this information and strategic planning and, and doing it really well. So um, it would be a privilege actually to help any of you who would like some help. Um, thank you, I hope you're watching the chat. I see Lauren has put the link to the Grove tools if that is something that interests you. All right, so once we've looked at the big picture of the environment, then we wanna do a little bit of a deep dive around our customers. Now, again, here's where we get some overlap with design thinking. For those of you who are, are familiar with design thinking, uh, design thinking is a, a, a good creative and customer focused process 
to uh, develop products, services, programs. For strategic planning, we're not going to get quite as in-depth because remember, we're working with an organization that may have a variety of customers, a variety of products and services. But understanding the main customers is very valuable. So this is a sample customer profile. And if you Google customer profile online or customer persona, you will see other options. Uh, you could fill in your boxes with some other things. But here I just went with a description of sort of who is this person demographically, uh, you're know, kind of a representative client. What's their worldview? How, what are their attitudes, their beliefs? Not about visual strategic planning, but maybe about their work or their life or their world. And then some things about what they're excited about or what they're worried about. Uh, and those of you who signed up earlier uh, got a handout on this and had a little bit more instruction on thinking about this. And this is something where you're looking at key customer groups. So for example, I did a project with the Animal Legal Defense Fund a few years ago. They are advocating for laws that assist animals. And they had different client groups or, or stakeholder groups, including law students, practicing lawyers, uh, courts where things come to trial about animal issues, uh, enforcement, uh, police and enforcement around animal cruelty, uh, legislators to pass new laws, and of course for any nonprofit, donors and possibly volunteers. So we actually did quite a bit of customer profile work as part of that process. They were a really sophisticated group, uh, had done a lot of planning and did a lot of good work, and this was really the most valuable because they had never taken the time to do any of this deep dive around um, audiences. So this can be really valuable. Was there anyone who had uh, a few minutes to uh, go through this and jot down any notes for your own clients, whether it is for the organization you're with or your personal practice. I know we have busy people here, so my expectations were not high, but does anyone have an experience they could share either by unmuting or hitting star six or the chat if you prefer? Hey, Karen, this is Brian. Thank you very much for, uh, for sharing these templates. Um, just by way of a little bit of, of background, um, I was a strategic planner for the, the government. I was a federal employee. Um, and I did all of my strategic planning using uh, Grove templates and similar templates to that. That's actually what got me into graphic facilitation. Um, you could think of the uses of templates as almost strategic planning in a box uh, and taking the... Um, you know, the ideas that are in people's heads and really putting them on, on paper in front of the large group. So thank you very much for sharing these. These are great. Fantastic. Thank you. Let's go ahead and because I want you to experience a couple of these templates tonight, we're not going to spend a lot of time. I'm actually going to ask you to think about this now. So think about your business or your organization. Again, some of you are internal. Some of you are, are graphic facilitators. And think about someone who is going to be a customer for visual strategic planning. This could be your current clients. It could be new clients. And if you're internal to an organization, I would think about are there decision makers that you need to sort of market this process to to get them to buy into visual strategic planning? Or do you want to think about your participants? And those groups may or may not overlap. There's, there's somebody that you're needing to, to, uh, to engage in visual strategic planning. And I encourage you to think about somebody who is representative of that group. Now, every person is unique, uh, but we can't tailor everything we do to every individual. So what does that person look like? Do they tend to be male or female? Are they a certain age? Are they in a certain kind of organization? or position, uh, et cetera. How, how, would the, how do these kind of people view the world? How do they think about things um, in general? Are they a politically of a certain mindset? Do they feel a certain way about visuals or data or their jobs in general? And then what are some things they're excited about? And what are some things that they really worry about? And we're just gonna take about two, three minutes and uh, just ask, we're not going to ask you to share this, so you don't have to say what you did, but go ahead and just try putting down a few things about your own work and if you were using this for your own personal strategic planning.
Okay, awesome. Again, this is an example of sampling from our buffet. Uh, three minutes is not enough time to do this justice, but I hope it gave you a bit of a flavor and I encourage you to do it. And um, you know, don't be afraid to, to do several for different kinds of target clients. I actually did three today. I did one for um, uh, heads of progressive nonprofits, uh, which is a, a core for me. Uh, I wanna do some infographic work and thought about media people and um, I've also interested in some, uh, some certain professional services. So I've, I've done three of these and I did get some really interesting insights with more time uh, around what, how I'm positioning myself, messaging on my website, et cetera. This was very brief. Did anyone have an experience that quickly enough that you would like to share anything that came up for you? And, and before we take that, I'll point, if you're not monitoring the chat, we've had some really great conversations with people bringing up things like um, uh, uh, Power Map, and empathy map and persona or avatar. These are some terms you might want to write down if you really like this. There's a lot of power in it. Those might be some things you want to Google uh, later and, and perhaps deep dive on some of these things and some alternatives. But anybody else have any uh, conversation? Okay, I want to try to use it. Do I share with client? Thank you, Paula. Paula has a question about what do you do with this? All right, there are a couple of different things that you would do. Um, and thank you for pointing out that we're kind of on a dual track this evening. The ultimate reason I'm presenting this is that this is something that you can do with your client, whether that's your internal planning team or you are a, a strategic planning consultant, graphic person. This is a client activity that you can do to help them think about their strategy, their audiences. That is reason number one that is presented. I also presented as, and the reason number two is that you can also use this for your own business. You have to have a strategy. So as long as you're learning this, you may as well get the benefit. And then number three, by working on this briefly here, but if you do more of this yourself, you'll be, you'll own it more. You'll feel more comfortable using it with clients and you may raise some questions and issues about, Hey, you know, I really thought I understood this, but you know, when I went to do it myself, it didn't work that well. So maybe I need to rethink it or maybe I don't like working with this particular format. So that's why we're doing those things. So you share it with a client when it is their business, uh, your business, I would, this is not something you would share to the, with the client. So uh, thank you, Paula, for that really important clarification. What other questions do we have at this point on what you've seen so far, anything that's come up so far? We'll have a big Q&A at the end, but if you're sitting there feeling lost, I do not want you to be lost for the rest of the evening. Please um, you know, raise a hand or hit the chat now if there's something we can fix for people now. All right, I will take silence as the opportunity to progress. Okay, next up. Whew. Okay, the next option is we just talked a little bit about the, at the highest level around uh, you know who is the customer and or or stakeholder what are they thinking about you know where are they now we want to dive a little more closely around how do they think about your organization or service uh, etc. So to keep us all on the same page as a group, we're going to stick to visual strategic planning because that's what we're here about. And what I'd like you to do is I'm just going to give you a minute to think about if you think about the, the client or customer uh, that you were just thinking about on the previous template and you really think about now, what might they be thinking about st visual strategic planning? What benefits might they be thinking about? What barriers might be on their mind of reasons they're not going to want to do it? And is there anything else? So what I'm going to give you is I'm only going to give you about a minute to just you know, brainstorm some thoughts for benefits and barriers, and then we'll open it up and we'll just ask people to throw some things out. And Lauren's going to help us by just capturing a picture of what are some of the kinds of things that people might be, you know, see as benefits and things that people might see as barriers. And again, this is a tool for you to use with your clients about their business, but it's also something you can use yourself to help with your own strategy and marketing. So a minute on thoughts here.
Thank you, Brian, for starting us off in chat. Some ideas of benefits. For those of you who may not be seeing the chat, uh, Brian is talking about that visual strategy. Thank you for Lauren for dropping in. Making, uh, makes decision making transparent, captures the evolution of ideas, engages many learning styles, or creative thinking. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Avra, Rachel. Lauren, they're keeping you busy there. <laughs> Flattening the hierarchy, fun and engaging, can be efficient. Power with aligned effort. Uh, Rachel, would you elaborate that for, for just a second, what you mean, either chat or, or verbally? What do you mean by power with aligned effort? Um, I think I mean like that, like a group is more powerful and can make better progress if they're aligned and they're aligning their effort to go in the same direction. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Visually conversations gives ideas, our overall understanding. Exactly. Okay. How about some of the barriers? Yep, Brian's got us started. Yeah, sure. This is, I'm not a visual person. That's great. Doesn't fit how we do things. I got somebody, somebody who actually knew me saying their executive director would think it was too touchy-feely. I'm like the least touchy-feely person on the planet. I thought it was pretty funny, but those things come up. Can't draw. Yeah, not understanding what they need to do, especially if you're someone maybe internal running a process. Not worth their time. Awesome. Sure, babyish, the other side of touchy feeling. And I'm gonna come back to your question in just a minute. Thank you. Okay, yeah, are we generating ideas that are within budget? That's that's a big deal for any kind of strategic planning. So is it practical? So these are again, we've done this very quickly, and I'm not we won't get into the what else, but sometimes it's good to have a little place to capture things that come up that maybe don't feel like barriers or benefits that are they're important. Uh, this is the kind of activity to help your clients or your inter internal or external think about what are they marketing and how are they being perceived and where are their strengths and weaknesses. Kind of, this is kind of going to lead us in that direction. Uh, thinky dewy. Thank you, Brian. It's not touchy feely. It's thinky dewy. Um, Anne asked a question when I'm referring to visual, am I talking about templates or do I capture the feedback visually? So my experience is that if I am really facilitating, I can't do that much drawing. It's a lot to juggle the conversation and remember where we are. And so I'd rather come in with a template and mostly write. Now that doesn't mean I might not sketch some simple things as I go, you know, some, some change arrows or some little figures or some, you know, some fairly simple kinds of things. But generally, it's, it's not super elaborate um, because you're so busy managing the conversation. Now, this is where it's a great place to partner. If you can find someone to work with who can facilitate so you can do more of graphic recording in this context, you could really team with somebody and bring your visual expertise, but not necessarily have to run the whole discussion in the room. So there's a lot of different ways to do it. But um, yeah, for, for planning, I would e either I'm going to come in with a template or I'm going to be doing something that's more capturing stickies or things like that. It's not going to be a whole lot of drawing live because there just isn't, I personally don't have the skill set to do it. Um, uh, and I, and I, have, I have worked in other situations and I worked with Brian on a project where we took a bunch of things live and then we drew it after for about an hour. We made something really pretty afterwards. So that's something I learned from him that you can also think about doing. Okay. All right. So this is a, is a tool you can use going forward, but I start here because grounding our planning in the people we are trying to influence is critical. You know, we're going to get to the whole rest of it next, but if we're not customer focused and externally focused, it's really likely our planning is going to go off track and not deliver the real value to the organization um, uh, in, in the end. So that's why I'm, we start here. Um, from there, we talk about uh, competition. This is a, a pretty simple competition matrix and again for a nonprofit these could be alternative organizations usually with an organization of any size uh, across the top here you, you know you would put you would put you know competitor one by name competitor two by name 
But then you might look at um, sort of a type of, of competitor. So maybe you've got a bunch of smaller organizations that you compete with that it isn't valuable to look at each one of them individually, but that collectively you want to look at some of these, these smaller competitors. And I also encourage you to look at not the potential entrant, but the potential entrant, which is to always be thinking not just who are we up against today, but who might come in tomorrow and bring in some new skills or be doing something uh, different. So at the top here, you're looking at who else do we need to be thinking about who we come up against and trying to do what we do. In these side boxes, you've got some different things that you can look at. The simplest approach which I've done is just have one box be strengths, one box be weaknesses, and the other box be implications. So what are the strengths of the first organization? What are their weaknesses? And what do we think that really means to us? If there's a type of organization, what are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? What does it mean to us? Another way is to look at some of their functional capabilities. Maybe you want to look at other organizations by how strong is their marketing function? How good are their products and services? Well, how are their operations? How profitable and financially strong are they? You could look at a bunch of uh, uh, you know, different functional areas and use that to guide a discussion. Another is to go more specific around offerings, uh, you know, benefits and features. So if we were looking at, a you know, if we were comparing for, you know, car manufacturers, you know, who maybe has the best, um, you know, the best aesthetics of a car, who has the most, uh, you know, comfortable kinds of rides. Some of that starts to get more into product planning than organizational strategic planning, but you, you do have some flexibility. So once you have the matrix, the idea is to put some bullet points to fill in some of these different squares. Process-wise, again, remember preparation is your client's friend. It's great if somebody spends some time you know, potentially thinking about competitors, um, going to the websites, looking at annual reports, seeing if there are news stories that analyze organizations or companies, maybe bringing some facts into bear. That's one way you could do it. You could also use breakout groups, have a breakout group that talks just about organization one, another one on organization two, another one on organization type, et cetera. So you could use breakout groups to get some deep dive. You might go the other direction. Uh, you might have a group of breakout groups. One looks at, let's look at these four companies or organizations. Who are the, who, what are their strengths and weaknesses and what are they doing compared to mar on marketing? What are they doing on operations? What are they doing on financials? But the goal is to get you know, some amount of depth and bullet points to really start thinking about the competitive playing field or the alternative organization playing field so you think about where you, where you are. Um, this is, this, I probably made that sound more complicated than it is. What questions do you have on moving forward with this kind of an analysis with your clients? And again, you can do it for yourself. Thank you for the positive feedback on my budding heads. You can tell, you know I'm a sheep person from my other visuals. I really enjoy that one myself. Uh, what I would say is if this is something you might want to try for your own uh, organization, uh, your own work, excuse me, not, not, not if you're internal, but for a consultants or for just your own personal uh, practice if you are within an organization, many of us, may not come up against, I always come up against that other visual strategy firm. There aren't that many of us. Uh, or I don't always come up against that specific uh, graphic recorder, but you might look at groups. So how do you compete against potentially gra uh, regular facilitators who don't do visuals? How do you compete against graphic recorders? How do you compete against strategy consultants who maybe don't do a lot of facilitation, but you know, present a lot of information? You could put different classes of organization across the top and give some thought to how you stack up. Um, if you are internal to an organization and you're saying, I don't compete, um, I have the strategic planning job, whether I like it or not, it still might be worth thinking about this for benchmarking. If you were to bring in a graphic facilitator or a graphic recorder or a strategy consultant, what things would they bring to the table? You could then make some choices to say, I'm not bringing in any of those people, but gee, I would really like to improve on this dimension so I could be more like a graphic facilitator, or I would like to improve on that dimension because I really like what strategy consultants bring. So this even has use to you, even if you're internal and thinking about my professional position. 
Uh, question from Nancy. Um, would implications be the final row for each of the various options? Um, I love that because it's really important that when we're doing strategic planning that we have three levels of discussion. There's the what, so what, and the now what. So what is most of what we have here, which is you know, what's happening and what are strengths and weaknesses? Implications start to push us into the now what, which is, you know, uh, excuse me, the, the so what, what does it mean? And now what, what are we going to do about it? I would say how far you have to push for um, uh, so what and now what depend on how much of the rest of this process you're going to do. A lot of the rest of the process is going to go more into the so what and the now what, but it's never too soon. It's never too soon to get into the so what, because you always want to be driving for what does this mean? What's actionable? And why do I care? You might hold off on the now what, because one of the problems with planning is people often want to rush right into solutions before they've really spent this time around, uh, around um, you know, thinking about what the issues are. So I would say, so what would be awesome for the bottom and, and implications. I would try to not let people run right away into, okay, so here's what we should go run and do. Great question. Great question. Okay. Uh, quick example of uh, this. This was an organization, uh, we did this sort of functionally, this, this is actually um, somewhat illustrative from something I actually did. A small organization, I actually had the executive director do the competitive analysis before a board meeting. You know, we had like about an hour or two for strategic planning and we had a two hour call in advance, we didn't have a lot of time. And so what I asked him to do was to rate uh, the different organizations along key dimensions just on a one to five scale. And then what I did was I just colored it in that a one, uh, so these, the, the one said that the competitor, the first one is a competitor one is significantly weaker on products than our organization. So that's a big old green because we got a big old advantage here over the competition. So that's great. If you go down the column and you compare it to um, competitor three, where products are a five, in that case, product competitor three is significantly superior. So that's a red. If we're trying to compete on products, we're, you know, we're getting some information here about where to focus. So this was a pretty quick way. And, and what it, so we didn't go through all of this cell by cell by cell. First of all, the board had no knowledge. The board couldn't fill in any of this. They didn't know the competitors well. And we didn't want to take the time to have the board learn everything about all the competitors. So we presented a pretty summary, uh, a pretty summary presentation. And then we took questions. So somebody might ask, you know, could you tell us what is competitor three is doing that they have such an advantage on products? So this is an example of um, uh, high level and quick and dirty um, and you know, generated more as preparation with not a ton of time together. But you can see, you could certainly do this with groups. You could certainly have the groups do ratings and do these kinds of things as, a, as another tool. Okay, uh, I wanna uh, raise a point that Brian is, is and actually Brian, I'm gonna come back to this when we get to competitive, um, now, now is good, now is good. Bri the question that Brian has asked is, there's a book out there called Blue Ocean Strategy, and the practice is about, rather than being slightly better than co your, comp your competitors, you want to do something totally different. You know, can you occupy a really different market space and really change the game as opposed to just doing something incremental? This is not a bad place to start because you may start to see things that your clients want from the customer persona and the customer profile that as you start analyzing the competitors, you say, huh, nobody else is doing that. Or, you know, now that I see what these customers really want, I see an opportunity that I could get into that might be a little bit different. So you can already start at this phase of looking at, is there something that's different as opposed to just incremental? We're gonna come back to competitive advantage shortly, and I wanna raise this blue ocean question again. So Brian, if I forget, please remind me to come back to it. All right, once we've done competition, now we can look at uh, the organization. This is another Grove template. Uh, I know we have a number of folks on this call who have done organizational histories. This is something great to develop with a group. Uh, for them to get a shared understanding. It's especially good if you have new people. It's good if you're working with a board of directors who is not as deeply involved. 
It's good if you have a planning group that maybe has people from outside the organization. I uh, Here is a simpler one that I have um, cleaned up and sanitized quite a bit that I did for a nonprofit. And that's exactly what we had. It was a small nonprofit, didn't have a lot of staff. We had board members in the room. We had um, outside people they had brought in to bring some additional expertise and perspective, which was awesome. And we started the session by uh, sharing a history map. We didn't create it together. It was something I worked with the executive director and, and we brought that in. So again, another example of not everything has to be done in the room. And that was, I think, a really good context. And of course, it was up the whole time and grounded really everyone in the organization. All right, the last uh, piece I want to touch on, I think, in terms of uh, where are we, is the SWAT, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, is there anyone who has never been involved in a SWAT, has never led one, has never been a participant one, has never, has never heard of it? Could you just you know, give me a high five in the type or, or in the uh, chat or something? I want to... All right, well, I'm going to go um, a little quickly. The strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats is basically what it says. When it is done well, it's an opportunity to pull together a summary uh, of a lot of what's gone before. So strengths and weaknesses is basically looking at the organization, which we've started to get into in the history, but you can use a SWAT to, uh, to bring it out. And opportunities and threats is a really great place to start getting into the so what of, of your looking at your customers, looking at the environment, looking at competitors or other organizations. Now you want to start pulling out, you know, well, so what? What does this all mean? What opportunities are we starting to see? What threats do we see? That said, I personally have not been a fan of the SWAT historically because I always get this. Talk to, start to organizations about their uh, strengths. They say, we have good people. Well, I think most of the organizations I've worked with, they do have good people. But strategically, that is a meaningless statement. So where I'd like to go with SWAT now is to have people put some parameters on it and really work a little harder on their SWAT. So if you're going to put a strength up there, is what you're saying clear and specific? Good people is not clear and specific. It's vague and it's vague. Is it something that ultimately fits back to what your customers and stakeholders are looking for? Maybe you have good people who um, all surf, but unless you're like a, some kind of something to do with your business that's got to do with surfing, that's not a strength we care about. And that's obviously a kind of a extreme and silly example, but we really want to ask people, bring this strength back. Is it really meaningful? Does it translate into something that helps us serve our market and stakeholders? Um, are you stronger than others? Again, you've, we've just been through our competitive analysis and been thinking about that. Maybe we have a strength, but maybe everybody else has the same strength. And maybe it's our strength, but we're weaker than everybody else. So asking people to think about that. And then finally, does it really move money? Is this something that's going to help us increase sales? manage expenses, um, fundraise for a nonprofit? Is this a strength that can translate into something to keep us going economically, which is really critical? So the way um, I have done this, I'm going to show you an actual example, but we have people rate uh, the different, the different uh, so put a, put a strength in the column, put strengths in the column, super SWAT, thank you, it's a super SWAT. Look at these kind of criteria. And then, you know, fill in the circles for how much you think it's true. And I, I thank Brian for this. This was actually the circle fill-in was something uh, when I was on a team with him that I saw and immediately stole. That's always really good. So, you know, a whole circle means that whatever was written here was, was you know, highly clear and specific. But maybe it was only sort of halfway there in terms of meeting our audience and about three quarters on stronger than others. So this, you know, kind of takes it to another level. Uh, I've done something pretty similar for opportunities, and you don't always have to do this exactly the same way. These are you know, some criteria to get you started, but depending where this falls in the process for you or how much you're doing with a client, you might do it a little uh, differently. Um, question is, is the super SWAT done individually or in a group? A number of different things you could do. You could certainly start with having people think individually. A lot of times in planning meetings, and I'm really guilty of this, we rush right into the group experience and we don't give people time to collect their thoughts. And especially the um, introverts or people who are more shy about speaking, they just get run over by the chatty folks among us. 
uh, who tend to jump in and go before the people have time to think. So it's always really good to give people some time. You could even give people stuff in advance. They may or may not have time. They may or may not want to, but some people like to come prepared to a meeting um, as opposed to have to think more on the fly. I'm one of those people. I don't really like spontaneous thinking as much. I'd rather have thought it through before I show up. Different people are different. Now, ways you could do this, as you'll see in the next slide, is I actually broke up a SWAT with a board. We only had about 10, 12 people. We didn't need to break up, obviously, by the size of the group, but we didn't have very much time. I think we had an hour to do the, the entire thing, which wasn't a lot. It was probably less than that even. And so we broke up into little breakout groups for each of the four quadrants, and this is the chart I gave them. I gave them a place to brainstorm, to toss the out ideas. I gave them the, the piece you just saw, which is, all right, from the brainstorm, let's take several of these that look promising, run them through the analysis. And then what we decided to do was, again, because it was a small group, once the analysis was up, uh, you know, this part was done, we had everyone, the whole group, went around to all the different charts and then dot voted for the ones that they thought were the most compelling. So the breakout group did not make the decision of which threats uh, in this one were the most important. The group as a whole made that. And we did you know, really little quickie report outs or people could just ask some questions for clarity, but it went pretty quickly. We were able to give the group some time as breakouts. We all got together to, to answer questions, make sure we knew what we were talking about. And then people voted on which ones they felt were most compelling for the organization. And then the last piece of this was that based on where this comes out, you then put your final summary over here. What are the ones that we voted on that we thought were the most important, um, et cetera. So that was, that was how that SWOT worked. Okay, onward from SWOT. All right. Um, I'm going to go through some of these, these pieces. I'm, I'm watching where we are time-wise. As I said, I knew there's, there's too much in here. Uh, so I'm going to pick and choose. On the where do you want to go piece, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on mission and vision. Um, mission and vision, there's a lot out there. Uh, the Grove has a template that we'll you know, go through in a moment that you can get. Mission and vision are things that should not be changing a lot unless there's a big change in the world. Um, and you'll note that while a lot of planning starts with mission and vision, I prefer to put it after the where are we? Because if mission is the purpose of our organization and vision is how we view the future of the world and the future of our organization, those might be affected by the analysis that we've all just been through. So um, if you are doing a, a, a mission vision as part of your process, I, I urge you to experiment with putting it here as opposed to starting there. Uh, Long-term goals and outcomes are the other, you know, where do you want to go? Those would be measurements. Those could be um, for business. That's going to be sales, return on equity, uh, 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 different kinds of growth rates, stock price. For nonprofits, that's going to be not just size of, of fundraising budget, but measurable outcomes about whatever it is they're trying to achieve in the world. Um, goals, the quantitative aspect, that's a little too complicated for me to try to start getting into tonight. So kind of know that's there. Um, if that's something you want to chat about at some point, we can brainstorm a little bit about it. But a good strategic planning project process does have its, uh, its, its quantitative aspects of, of measurement and success measures. Okay, again, here's one from the Grove, a fairly simple uh, vision planning tool, uh, something simple that I did. This was a tabletop template. This was a group of about 25. It was a coalition, so it was not a traditional strategic plan. Uh, they, they didn't do a lot of time together, but this was uh, some things we wanted them to look out and do some brainstorming in the clouds and then come into what was their vision for accomplishments and activities. All right, how will you get there? This is the heart of the strategic plan. So, and now we're getting into the now what part. So we've, we've done the what, we've done the so what, now we're getting into the now what, what are we actually gonna do? And what I really love is, I, you know, I read a quote by Michael Porter recently, who said that strategic planning is all about trade-offs. And that's what happens at this part of the, the process. You can't do everything well. And companies that try to you know, be all things to all people and do a million different things, those are not companies that succeed. 
Um, even big companies have to have focus on what they do. And so a lot of value that you bring to your planning process is by helping the organization think about how to make trade-offs. So we're going to talk about um, advantage primarily. We're going to touch on target markets. And I will talk about priorities, which is actually the simplest of the three. But I want to start by talking about advantage and distinctiveness. So this is uh, going back now to where we just did our competitive analysis. We talked about different organizations. Now we want to think about our organization. Now we want to summarize, and this is like, you know, also comes from the strengths, the, the SWAT, the strengths and weaknesses. Where are we really going to excel? Where are we going to do something wholly different? And that speaks to the blue ocean strategy that Brian was raising, which is about, you know, really changing the game, changing the nature of competition, doing someone knowing else, no one else is doing. Or where are we going to at least lead? Maybe we're not doing something radically different, but we are going to actually be the leader in this field and we are going to stand out in a way that we can either um, earn significant profits as a business or make a major impact as a nonprofit and fundraise. Something is going to lead the arrow. Other things are going to go in different places. So for some things, we're going to be better than a lot of organizations. But a lot of things we're probably going to choose to be average. We're not, no one is going to be better than, than everybody at everything. And making these kinds of conscious choices are really helpful to an organization to think about where to invest time and resources. And it's okay to lag. It's okay to say, you know, in this kind of a function or with this customer segment, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not even going to try to be average because it just isn't going to be the best way for us to succeed. Um, this is something I urge you to do yourself for your own uh, practice. And again, you can even do it if you're internal to an organization and thinking about where you want to invest your time as being an internal visual strategic planner, because you can get a lot of really interesting insight. And I'll just share the one I hear. Oh, actually, here's one I did with a bank um, eons ago. Um, I actually did this in 1995. I didn't realize I've been a visual strategic planner for uh, 23 years. I thought it was only three years, but apparently it's been 23. <laughs> uh, pulled, this, pulled this out of the, the ancient box. But this was a, a major bank in California. And with, we were working with the mortgage lending division. And we looked at the different things that the organization did. And in this chart, we were comparing them to other um, banks that, that held mortgages. There's also mortgage companies that are a little different. So we, we, we did something else as well. But what we worked with, um, with the group was to come at that they were going to lead with their understanding of the market, that they were going to invest in the kind of um, processes and systems and management time to understand the market they were playing into better than anybody else. And they felt that was going to really enable them to take advantage of opportunities quickly, to uh, outsmart the competition. That was going to be their lead function. They were going to be heavy on sales and service. They were going to be strong on um, production of mortgages is the origination process. There's not a physical production. But they were going to uh, get strong on, on sales and service. But they were not going to be the lead underwriter. They weren't going to be bad underwriters. They just weren't going to have the loosest criteria and be the most competitive of, you know, taking, you know, less credit worthy borrowers. They were not looking for a lot of growth right now. They decided they, you know, they were not going to do that as much. And profit, they were going to, like, you know, look to be average. They weren't necessarily going to be the most profitable in the market right now. So this was a process we went through. Uh, this was a planning team of about 10 to 12. So I'm, I think we did this as a whole group. I don't think we had breakout groups. I don't think we had any preparation. This was just something we did together. Um, I put together this one for myself. And this is about visual strategic planning. And I sat down. This is my current picture. I thought about you know, where do I feel I bring something special? And where am I kind of in the pack? And where do I currently lag? So as uh, I mentioned, my background is strategic planning. So my strengths um, in visual strategy are database planning and insight into strategy and marketing, because I've been doing that for a lot of years. Uh, I have industry insight in a couple, of, uh, a couple of fields. And I'm a good analytical thinker. So those are really my strengths. Um, I'm not good with big groups. I do not want to work with more than 30 people. I'm not sure I really want to work that much with more than 10. So I'm, I don't have those skills. I lag 
lots of people probably on this call who would be outstanding. I'm not a strong letterer person. Um, I, I, yes, thank you. Where are my, my cartoon animals? They're supposed to be on there, yes. Um, cartoon animals are, are useful with the animal protection field for sure. They're a little less useful elsewhere. But this was just sort of a map of where do I think I am and where are my strengths? I don't think I'm as good at, at fostering creativity as a lot of other people are. I'm, I'm kind of average, but I, but I might lag a little. So I encourage you to really think about this because you start with, you know, where are you? And then you go to, well, where do I want to be? Which of these things do I want to move? You know, which of these things do I want to say, maybe I don't want to lead with database planning. Maybe I want to get better at group activities. So you can start thinking of, you can start thinking about moving these things around. And again, this is a tool for your clients. Whatever business they're in, what are the different aspects of what they're delivering to their audience? How do they currently stack up against competition? So do one map with them of where they are and then let them talk about uh, you know, where do they want to go? Because this then drives the train. Because if you look at just this one for me, Assuming that the, the, my current is pretty close to the desired, which, which it is, it's pretty close, I'm probably wasting my time to spend a bunch of time on lettering. I should probably get competent more, you know, you know, if you can read it and I've got enough variety to make it work, that should be it for me. So instead of send, you know, signing up for the next lettering training class, even though it could be a fantastic class and I would learn a lot, I would be better off. Uh, you know, doing, you know, doing things that are going to be my strengths and just kind of maintaining a baseline uh, competency. Um, I see some, yeah, where you're the best athlete. That's what Brian talks about. And there's things about that, playing to your strengths, not trying to fix all your weaknesses. You know, have a baseline, but don't make yourself crazy. Um, Lisa's talking about, you know, this would be a good thing to do with sticky notes. Absolutely. Put up a big template, put up your stickies, move them around, maybe get your, if you have a small group, let them come up and move things. Absolutely. So this is really powerful and something you can use with clients. And the nice thing is, I hope once you've seen this, I think this is pretty straightforward. But let me stop for a minute and ask what questions you might have about uh, you know, this, um, this in particular, since I think this is really at the heart of good strategic planning. Remember, you need to unmute or hit star six if you want to talk to us. All okay. right. I this yes, is very, this is a very exciting tool, Karen. I, I saw lots of comments about various uses for this, not only with facilitation and and um, and leadership, but also as a coaching practice as yep. well. So this is this is a great one. Awesome. I personally awesome. About this. Okay. Uh, so again, you have your current template. You have desired where you want to go. All right, some things I'm going to breeze through a little bit. Target audience is basically that you have to say something to someone instead of nothing to everyone. And I forget whose quote that is, but you cannot market to everyone. Even Coke and McDonald's probably don't market to absolutely everyone. But most of the clients that we're working with, they're not a mass consumer brand with millions and billions of dollars. We are generally working with organizations that have some constraints and they need to direct their offerings, their pricing, their capabilities to meet the audiences that are going to be most promising for them in terms of interest in what they've got and in, and in a way they can do profitably. So if, if you're working with an organization that is dealing with people, um, whether that's consumers or as um, uh, stakeholders to a nonprofit or an educational institution, then you're looking at, you know, at a basic, are you looking at particular, you know, age or income or other demographics? Um, more powerful is what about mindset? You know, we can have two 28-year-old women who live in Washington, D.C. and make the same amount of money standing next to each other, and they could be night and day different people. So you need to push to the next level. How do they think? You know, what are their attitudes? What's their lifestyle? And what's their experience or relation to what it is you're trying to do? So um, if you're marketing a consumer product like soda, there are, there's a segment of really heavy soda drinkers. That's a really good segment for a company to market soda to, and it's good to know who they are and, and how you might reach them. So you want to think about who is at the core of your effort? Who are your most important, most valuable customers? When you are marketing to organizations, 
Uh, same issue. Are you working with businesses, nonprofits, governments? Do you want a specific industry or field? Are you looking for a size, a geography, a culture? Now it's in, it's it's um, easy to say, and I, I really have pushed back on this with the nonprofits who say we want everyone to be environmentally friendly. We want everyone to um, you know buy responsibly or shop responsibly, and that's true. You want everyone. It's not that someone's, you know, you're going to turn someone away and say, I'm sorry, you're not in my target audience for consumer. I don't want you to recycle. You, you don't do that, please. But what you're saying is you only have so much time and so much staff and so much money, even if you have millions of dollars, even a billion dollar company, you've got to put it where you think you can get the most return. So target market is, is a big point. And um, the thing is, it's, it's, um, it's a lot of gestalt. This is definitely a so what, now what portion. I can't say if you do exactly these five steps, you'll get your answer here. And I'll also say this is iterative. Because if you start to think about who is your target audience based on all the things you've done, you might then want to go back and say, hey, you know, now that our target audience is such and such, we actually need to refine our competitive analysis. We need to know more about what that um, what that particular audience wants. So this is a piece that's a little more tricky. I'm going to put it out there. And again, um, you know, this is what I'm happy to talk to anybody about who would like to, to talk about this at any point. Yes, very, very iterative. Okay, next up, priorities. In strategic planning, one of the outcomes as you start to winnow down is, all right, now what? What are we going to focus on? Where are we going to put our time? So I have generally an annual strategic planning process, which is what most of my work has been. We usually set somewhere between three to seven priorities for the coming year. And what is a priority? Well, first of all, it's something that there's about three to seven of them. So it's not going to be some little tiny tactic and it's, it's going to be something substantial. And again, I've got kind of a little checkbox thing to think about, you know, what, what musters, what passes muster. It's got to be important to the, your strategy. You've just spent all this time talking about opportunities and threats, competition, competitive advantage, target market. Your priorities should somehow relate to, to moving you forward in that context. It should be something that needs improvement. It should be something that doesn't exist. Maybe you need a new product, a new process, a new skill or capability. Um, it could be that it's something that is deficient that you need to improve. It could be something that you're actually good at but maybe you decided you wanted to be the leader, and so you need to take it from good to great. So there's kind of a sense of it's something we need to, to move on. And it should show some measurable results within, if this is a one-year planning process, I'd want to see that you're going to have a reasonable action plan and measurable results in like six to 18 months, you know, kind of either side of that one-year window. So don't set as a priority something that you can't measure at all for five years because you can't track it, you can't see where you're going, you need to kind of bite off what's the piece of something that we can do in a one year time frame. The way that I have mostly done this with groups is by the time you've been through everything we've been through or even a piece of it, you know, you, you, the, the priorities are starting to emerge. You're starting to see from the opportunities, the threats, the competitive advantage, things will suggest themselves. So this is normally a brainstorm followed by a dot vote or something to pick the top ones and followed by using these check boxes to double check them. And then looking at kind of the gestalt of, as we look at them all together, does this seem reasonable? Or do we have seven priorities that we know are gonna overwhelm us? Now you can't necessarily answer that all immediately, but that, that's kind of the process for priorities. All right, so with that, we've been through, uh, you know, really the whole piece of um, where are you going? Where are you? Where are you gonna go? How will you get there? Um, how we stay on track, I have been surprised how many um, really solid quality organizations I've been through that did not have an action plan format. And when I gave them this, they thought this was like the best thing since sliced bread. So if you have just set your priorities, then a great way to move your strategic plan to not be that bad plan that sits on the shelf is for each of the priorities, develop an action plan. It could be an action plan for the year, might be, you know, a few things for the next quarter and things that stretch out, but get that going. 
Most of the plans, I have done the processes. This has been an offline process. Most of the organizations I've worked with are good at this kind of thing, and they didn't need to pay me to help them do it. They just needed me to get them started and maybe look at the results. But I did have one client that this was where they wanted to focus. This was the, the, the client that brought in the advisors and the uh, board because it was a small organization. And they wanted their planning group to think about for some key areas where they wanted to focus, um, you know, what would an action plan look like? So this were, these were big wall charts and you have stickies and the groups moved around and you know, put things up there. And then we looked at all the charts together. It was powerful. It was really good. I mean, if I were going to action plan with a group again, I actually would suggest this because I thought it was really effective. So um, I commend this to you. And, and as you can see, it's really easy. Um, you know, I'll make a comment so far, especially for those of you who are new to graphic recording or are internal to an organization and maybe don't have a lot of visual skills. You've got the Grove, which is um, uh, you know, strategic planning in a box and has some really nice looking templates, but nothing you've seen me do tonight really requires any drawing at all. It's visual in the sense of its structure, its layout, um, but it doesn't have to be art. So um, I hope you can see that there's lots here that anybody um, can take on. All right, so wrapping at the, uh, the end, I, I warned you we were gonna be pretty heavy on components and indeed we have been. Let's talk a little bit about process. Uh, just some things to think about when you are designing a project like this, whether it's internal or with uh, existing clients or new clients, um, how many people are gonna be involved? It's really different what's involved depending on the number of people. In my experience, um, I really like seven people. Um, 10 or fewer is about the most I feel I can handle that you can have a lot of full group time and you don't have to worry too much about the structure. You might do some pairs, you might do some breakouts, but it does, it, it's not like a big, um, I don't want to say burden, but yeah, I'm going to say it because that's how it feels to me. Um, from 10 to 30, the dynamic starts to shift that you're going to spend a lot more time thinking about how do I manage 10 to 30 people in order to get them to do things. And you start to have a trade off of, I think, the amount of time you spend on process, even in the room, versus the amount of time you spend on content. Now, that doesn't mean you don't get better results. I'm just saying it shifts where you spend your time. And once you get about 30, that to me is a really big group and you really have to start thinking about process and you really have to narrow what you're going to do. You can't possibly do a, like, a process like we've done tonight with 100 people um, unless you're going to keep them for several months. So um, from a practical standpoint. Um, things that I recommend, um, if you can, I recommend not doing more than six hours of strategic planning a day. It's really mentally intense and people just get fried. And by two, three o'clock, if you start at nine, they start becoming unglued and unruly and unfocused not because they're bad people, because it's just too much. Um, if you have people coming in from out of town, it can be really hard because people want to use the whole day. I respect that. I do that. Um, if you have a situation where the management team has something else they want to do with the group, get your planning done from nine to three and let them do their other stuff later in the afternoon that hopefully isn't quite as challenging. Uh, 15 minute break every 90 minutes, I contract for that. It's not just for me. If the group doesn't get a break, they're going to start hitting the bathrooms, they're going to start wandering, breaks, 30-minute lunch, et cetera. Uh, roles, I think I'm going to actually just skip over that for now. Here's an example of a project. This was a really big project I did with a nonprofit leadership team and board, about 10 to 12 people. And you can see this was three comprehensive meetings. We used a phone call in the middle. Uh, and phone calls can be good or webinars could be good to, to do a little bit of heavy duty lifting, maybe to avoid some of those eight hour meetings. Uh, but you can see we focused on the stakeholder strategic issues, tons of prep, tons of prep. I did all the data analysis before we ever started this project, people reviewed it. So we focused on really the, the so what and the now what. We didn't have to do so much of the what as a group, although we did build on what we had. We spent a lot of time on comparative position or competitive position. We looked at measurements, which we didn't talk about tonight. We talked about priorities. And 
we spread some things across meetings. This was really nice. Even though these folks were in New York, we did this as a series of three meetings, probably a few weeks apart. And so there was time to digest, time to go back. I strongly recommend that, if, especially if you are internal with your team, if you can kind of avoid the two-day retreat and have a chance to do some stuff and digest and course correct and get more information, um, I, I think you get a better process. Uh, not that, I mean, two-day retreats are great too, but I, if you can spread it out, I think sometimes that works, works really well. Here's the one that was doing all the um, action planning. Uh, so this was, was, they started with some introduction, they had a history chart, the objectives, I don't actually think we used the group to come up with the objectives. I think the management team brought them in and then we did the action planning and so forth. But this was still a good couple of days. You know, it really took us a good solid two days. Um, my biggest problem, and you've seen it tonight, is the tendency to overcram the agenda. Uh, I don't recommend that. Then everyone is stressed and rushed and no one is happy. So if you can avoid that, I recommend it. So finally, uh, next steps. Uh, again, I emphasize the buffet nature. We could have spent many, you know, this could be like a whole week long training program. We've blown through some things in 90 minutes. So I really encourage you to recap a little bit on what's of value to you. Um, I have given you in strategy overview, just a few articles, just putting in words and paragraphs and text, some of the context of what we've done. The managementhelp.org site is really good. That one is long. That is, is meant for, um, it's designed for nonprofits, but it's really good for businesses too. And they blow out a lot of the pieces in detail. So you might like look at that and say, hey, I want to think a little bit more about customer profiles or whatever. And there's a lot of really good free stuff to read. So I like that resource a lot. I've used it for years in different ways. Reminder about grove.com and the opportunity to get templates. Somebody who's used some of these templates, uh, Brian or others, do these come with instructions? I assume they come with instructions. You just get a template. Brian, Somebody, you should read that. Anybody else use the Grove templates and, and know if they come with anything? I have gotten it. Go ahead, Brian. Sorry, I, I was on mute. Um, so you can order the templates on their own and they show up in a couple of different formats, um, large wall charts, uh, 11 by 17 tabletop formats. Um, I would recommend that you start with um, the, the card deck, which is a set of uh, orange bordered cards and it's called strategic visioning cards, which have basic instructions on the back. Um, in addition to that, they also have what are called leader guides. Um, which are uh, larger, more in-depth instructions. Um, you can order leader guides individually for every uh, template that you want to use. Great, and thank you, thank you, Heather Lynn, for, for, for sharing that as well. All right, one of my biggest jobs as a facilitator is to end on time. And so I want to be respectful. This, this really was the last page of content. I can touch on these other resources. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask uh, Lauren to give us sort of our official close for our 9 o'clock stop um, I invite anyone who uh, needs to move or would prefer to move on to other things to depart at this time. And then we're going to sit around um, uh, more informally till 930. Um, I'll talk about these last couple of resources. We'll uh, open up to all kinds of questions. Um, I'd love to hear from some other folks who have experience if you want to share perspectives. But let's let Lauren wrap up our 9 o'clock stop, and then we will uh, open it for the, the informal half hour. Thank you, Karen. Oh my gosh, can we all give Karen a round of applause? <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> that was so great, Karen. Thank you so much. Um, you, gosh, you made my job super e easy. I don't know how you, you just did such a beautiful job of, of um, leading us through this session and answering questions throughout the session. And I know that you condensed a lot of information very tacit for you. So thank you so much for sharing this and putting this together. Um, they're really, I, you know, I know, um, I know initially this was geared more towards beginners or transitioning facilitators, but there really was something in here for everyone. So, you know, I just, I really appreciate it. Um, so for everyone on the call, um, you know, uh, we are recording this, so we'll post a YouTube link if you had to join us late. Um, or if you want to catch some of the questions after the fact, um, we'll send that out this week so you'll get that. Um, and, uh, and maybe a feedback survey, Karen and I, we, we didn't talk about that. That would but be we great.
you may do a feedback survey, so please look out for that. Um, otherwise, check back to our events page on Nova Scribes. Um, May 17th, the Systems Thinking, the in-person session, we'll post that this week. And then you have events on May 24th and also June 21st. So lots of really great stuff coming up. So, uh, uh, and then for anyone else who's staying on for additional questions, um, Karen, if you wouldn't mind just starting with, um, Angie had one question related to your slide on, um, uh, well, I think it was a general process facilitation question. Um, Angie, are you still on? Do you wanna, do you wanna ask it? Yeah, I am. So um, I've done things, so my question was related to either the super SWAT or the priorities. Yeah. Where you have, you know, you've listed the items that the group has brainstormed and then you have some kind of evaluation criteria next to them. And I'm curious, do you, just in terms of a process question, how do you keep the group positive during that? So have you introduced those criteria before they brainstorm? Or are you introducing those afterwards? And if so, how do you deal with the, oh no, I didn't do it right kind of scenario? Great, great. What, great question. So a uh, couple of different parts to the answer. In terms of, one question could be, do I define the criteria before I come in? And normally I do, because normally there just isn't enough time. If you had a more ongoing process, you might even have the group define the criteria of what should we evaluate. But generally I'm defining it up front and usually I'm working with one person or a couple of people who sign off that, hey, this is what we're going to, we're going to do. Um, I would always introduce it up front. So the way I would present a SWOT to a group is actually the same way I presented it to you. I would talk about the good people problem and I would tell them, oh, this is why I don't do this and this is what we don't want, but here's how we're going to work together to get something awesome. And so here are your instructions of after you brainstorm, here's how you're going to walk it through. I would do the same thing for priorities. I would define upfront what is a priority, again, almost exactly as I did for you. Because one of the biggest issues with strategic planning, and I've been really pretty guilty of this, is that there's so much terminology, mission, vision, strategy, priorities, and every consultant does it differently or every organization does it differently, that people are really confused. So anytime I would be starting with any of these things that had that kind of a term, I would start by saying, what is this? What are we talking about here? And then for priority, I would have given them the exact four factors that I gave you. Great question. Thank you. Super. Thanks a lot. Okay. All right. I think, uh, Lauren, were there any other pending questions? I'll just go back to those last two resources real quickly and then open it up to other questions. Um, Anything else that I, I missed? Just, uh, Paula, if you have any other, I, I know you had a question around um, when to use the competition slide or the competition template. Is that, do you still have that question? If you're on. Hi, Karen. Um, yeah, I was just curious in what situations um, someone, you would suggest that or someone might benefit from that. And uh, which we, are you talking about the competitive comparison or the competitive advantage? Um, the comparison. The comparison. Okay. And let's yeah. go, let's um, see if I can get us back to that for a moment too while we're talking about it. So we are talking about... And how long would it typically take to go through something like that? Okay, so we're talking about this slide. Um, I would do this, this to me is a core part of strategic planning, to, to have some time thinking about who are the other organizations. And Paula, just so I can be a little more focused, do you tend to work with businesses or nonprofits or um, educational institutions? Who, who do you work with? Well, I'm just starting out, but I just recently had a meeting with the natural foods company and they're wanting to grow and we went through all of what you were talking about tonight but I didn't have any of your templates but the conversation just naturally excellent did this <laughs> so this is really interesting and we were talking about the competition but I was just curious you know I didn't know how much she would want to talk about the competition because she's so focused on her marketing and her her own products so oh but but no but see but see 
Uh, great question, Paul. I'm so glad you raised this. Yeah, I would absolutely do this. And um, I don't want to pry into who the client was, but you know, let's say they're a certain kind of, um, are, they, are they sort of a, a single product or a fairly similar line or do they have a really diverse range of products? Yeah, so um, it's basically like a natural bar, um, but there's a like, six, there's 1600 bars in the right. market. You know, it's so saturated, um, but she has sort of a unique bar and um, she's trying to differentiate herself and um, she's trying to focus on that we taste good we're full of flavor we're not trying to just target the audience um, for sports or like we're all about flavor okay so that's that's fantastic, Paul. Yeah, I would absolutely do that. And you're right, you're certainly not going to go through 1600 competitors uh, <laughs> and do that. But I would be looking, even in your conversation, as you've said, there are, there, are, there are classes. So you've talked about maybe some of the athletic bars. There are other natural foods bars that use natural ingredients. I hear she's um, trying to separate on taste. I would want to know who does she think are the closest bars to her that are known for the best taste. I and mean, at some right. level, when we look at consumer needs, people don't eat things that don't taste good for the most part. So all bars taste good. Most bars taste good to varying degrees. So I would definitely want to be thinking about who does she think is closest to her in terms of um, either having superior taste or marketing on superior taste. And then I would want to look at those, um, maybe uh, a couple of individuals as individual companies or bars. And I would want to think about not just the taste. I'd want to think about what's the nutritional profile of the bar. I'd want to think about packaging. I'd want to think about um, grocery store penetra penetration. I mean, how successful have they been? Are they marketing through natural food stores? Are they in the mainstream markets? I'd want to know how well financed they are versus how well financed she is. So I would absolutely want to take a look at the, the closest bars um, kind of as a kind of as a reality check, um, mm -hmm. kind of as a reality check to start. Because, um, again, I hope these are the best bars in the entire world and they really are good. And at the same time, I, I have a little bit of skepticism around, but all bars have to taste good. And they not only have to taste good, but, you know, a lot of people who are looking for bars are looking for a certain nutritional profile. Does it taste really good because it's all full of, um, um, you know, sugar and, and fats? And that's fine. That means you want a certain market segment that isn't really particularly health conscious. Whereas another one, another segment, if they really like flavor, but they're also really health conscious and this brand is different, then, then she's going to want to think about all those things. So, so yeah. I think this would be really powerful, but Paula, have I explained it in a way that you see how you would use it? Yeah. If I could get her to, um, if I could explain it the way you just did so well to her and get her in, more interested in going through an exercise like that, that would be great. What I might suggest is rather than trying to explain it, which might feel challenging since it's so new. And again, you and I can talk offline. Yeah. I'm happy to talk mm -hmm. to you is, um, uh, you know, if you could, from the interview you've already done with her, could you start filling this in a little bit? Could you, mm -hmm. you know, maybe put in the top and put in the side and, and, you know, maybe put in some of her comments and say, you know, this is what I've heard, but what about this or what about that? So rather than kind of getting her to buy into the whole analysis, um, and again, this may be tough if you're structuring a project and she hasn't agreed to pay for this yet. So I don't know if that fits, but, yeah. but you know, you might think, you know, is there a way to just kind of give her a little taste mm -hmm. of what this might involve rather than just trying to explain it conceptually, which is, which can be hard. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, I did sketch note it and gave, created an infographic for her. Wonderful. Um, so that was, um, that was really helpful. And so, but I like, I like the way you, um, you created your visuals. Great, great. Okay, um, let me just briefly touch on these last two resources that I didn't get to. They were the, probably the lesser important of the two, but I, I actually just found this smartinsights.com. And if you sign up for their free level, they had a couple of things around, they had something called essential marketing models, which just had some other templates. Um, if your head is already swimming from how many things we've gone through tonight, mm -hmm. don't go to either of these um, uh, things on the right right now. Put them, put them off. Uh, but if you're looking for some other stuff or just want to get some different perspectives, the essential marketing models was good. The marketing plans guide, I think, was the one that talks about what's a strategic plan versus a marketing plan versus a business plan. 
not to make you experts, but if you're getting confused, sometimes it's helpful to see those things laid out. And sometimes you need to lay that out with a client. So for free, I thought those were a couple of good guides. This um, show me, don't tell me. This was, although it's um, set up for uh, marketing communications, it's got a lot of frameworks and a lot of templates that overlap, you know, the kinds of things we've talked about tonight, uh, because good communications start with good strategy. It's, very, again, this is way overwhelming. I mean, I picked it up and I was overwhelmed, even, you know, with my background. So do not go here if you, if you um, are, are feeling you don't want that right now. But if you're someone who kind of looked at what we did tonight and said, I'd like some other perspectives, or I've got a couple of things that are here that I like, but I'd like to see what else is out there. This was, was not a bad book. And I actually found it at the library. Um, so, you know, before you go and invest in it, you know, you may be able to just get it, look at it, see if it's to your style. I, I think it is visually a very unappealing book. It's very busy. So, so at least do the look inside an Amazon before you commit to it. Cause it's, um, it's probably really good for some people and really bad for other people. Yes. All right. So those were the questions. Well, um, I'm going to turn it over to just your questions for the remainder of the time. But what I would really encourage you to do um, as at, either as we're talking about questions or whenever you personally choose to drop off, is give yourself a couple of action items. You know, what did you take away tonight that you want to do something with? Because it's all interesting and there's all a lot going here and you're all really busy. And tomorrow you're going right back to whatever it was you've been doing all day and it's going to be really easy to let this drift away and say, well, I really enjoyed it, but I never got any action and I never really got the benefit of it. So think small. Pick one thing, you know, one chart you want to work with or one resource you want to look. But I really encourage you, uh, you, can, you know, you can make your own little action plan if you want with the plan you've been given, but it doesn't have to be that complicated. Please uh, translate this into something. And, and again, remember that you have all my contact information in the handouts and, and I can help. So with that, we have lots of time. What other questions can I answer for you? Karen, let's get this one from Deborah. Um, Deborah, can you unmute yourself and ask your question about the priorities? There we go. Hi, Karen. This was great. Thank you so much. Um, on the priority slide, you mentioned that it was like a winnowing down process and you started with brainstorming. You said there were several steps like dot voting and I didn't catch them all. Can you yes. just reiterate that? I would, I would appreciate the opportunity to do that. So at this point, a lot of the priorities have started to have likely started to emerge organically from what has gone before in terms of as you're talking about opportunities and threats, as you're talking about implications um, from the competitive analysis and competitive advantage, there's probably been stuff floating around that's going to be top of mind for people. Um, you know, you might even catch some of that stuff as you go. You know, if you hear a lot of energy, you might say, oh, this sounds like something, you know, that, that, that might come back as a priority, but that's, that's a little above and beyond. What I would do is this is a session I would normally take an hour for the session with a small group and I would start, you know, we might recap, uh, you know, one of the things I like, I, I told you I wasn't a big fan of the SWAT, um, um, although maybe I like the super SWAT a little bit better. You could, before you go into priorities, summarize by saying, what are really some of the key strategic issues we've heard so far today and get, or, or, or over the process and let people kind of, digest down all that conversation and say, we really got to do something about competitor X, Y, Z. And we really need to up our capability around that. And there's a big threat coming from such and such. So you could start by pulling together a lot of what's gone before by letting the group just talk about what are the key issues they've had. And either you can just keep that informal and just list a bunch of stuff, or you can actually have people vote on that which I have done and have people say, what are the top you know, three to five strategic issues facing us? Things we need to think about. Then we can turn to, all right, if those are the strategic issues, you know, including our advantage and whatever, so what are the most important things we need to do in the next year? And I would lay out the definition, just as you know, we were discussing earlier, what, you know, what is a priority, what does this mean? And then I would let people start to brainstorm and I would capture things up on the flip chart. So first you do a little brainstorming. Again, maybe letting those introverts come up with some ideas first. Um, 
then you have some open discussion because now maybe you got 10, 12 things on the board. And, you know, people want to talk a little bit about, well, you know, I think this one is the most important because, or, uh, you know, I would think this one. And then there kind of comes a point where it's like, okay, we have discussed this, you know, do we feel we have enough information to, you know, to take a vote and to, um, and to choose. And, and let me caveat that, that you need to clear with who's ever in charge of this organization and this session is this a decision-making group or is this an input group? Because a decision-making group is voting. A, a input advisory group is, I tend to use the term indication of support or indication of preference. And I will say explicitly, this is not a vote. So-and-so is gonna take this offline and make the final decision. So, um, and, and the truth is, if that's, that's an issue that really, I should have gotten in the introduction of the session. You know, really when people are invited and when people are being told what the day is about, uh, it's good to remind them of, of roles, which was, was something I kind of skipped over. But at that point, I, I don't think I've ever had a group, usually we just vote on priorities. I don't think I've ever had a group where somebody raised their hand and said, we don't have enough information to make this decision. Because generally, if you've done a lot of the stuff that's come before, you've already given the analytical underpinning that people should know why something is a priority. But it is always possible that somebody could come up with something and say, well, we should do such and such. And you know, hey, we didn't really look at that in detail. You know, maybe we want to kind of put this provisional, we'll kind of put it below the line and we need to do some more work to see if that stays or goes. But generally it's, it's brainstorm, discuss, vote, look at, look at the gestalt. Um, if you can keep it small, really, I prefer three to five. I don't really prefer three to seven. I think what generally happens is I'll position it as three to five, and sometimes we end up with seven anyway. Um, but we'll have a lot about, you know, what do you think you can really do? And I've had groups that have, by, based on their vote, it's looked like if they've had five to seven, and they'll look at it and they'll say, just put a line under the first two, because that's all we can possibly handle in addition to our day-to-day -day things. Um, the group can do that. Again, you might have a subgroup or an executive leader who's ultimately going to take it away. Um, and also, when you get more into the action planning, which also can then start to lead into resources and budget, you may then start to, when you get your numbers on things, to say, we'd like to do these five things, but realistically, we don't have the money to do these things. Great. Great. Thank you so much. Certainly. What else? What other questions do we have tonight? I got one for you. So yeah. Lauren and I are getting ready to do a strategic planning offsite for 125 people. Yeah. <laughs> Better you than me. <laughs> any advice? Um, do I have any advice? Uh, tell me, tell me a little bit more. What what kind of people are they? Are, is it is this a full staff of an organization? Who have we got? No, from? it's not. It's not a whole system. So what it is is it it's a uh, it's a group of um, civic leaders from across a region in Virginia. Okay. Uh, and we were thinking that what we were going to do is, is um, uh, use methods from open space technology uh, and really kind of put most of the, uh, the, the process on them just because it was such a large group. Um, they don't need to walk out of this with a strategic plan. They just need to gr agree on kind of self-formed teams and initiatives to work on. Okay, so teams and... Initiatives. All right. So initiatives to me feels like it's priorities. That there and how many initiatives? So are they going to be walking away with like, you know, five major initiatives that they're going to like partner up on, or what? What do you? What do they? What do you want to leave with? So that's up to them. Um, okay. It's really a lot of these people have never worked with each other before. Okay. Um, they're all uh, volunteer organizations and separate volunteer organizations. Neat. Mm -hmm. Neat. Um, so, and, and, and their civic organizations, are they working on a common cause? I mean, what's the problem? What, what's the subject matter they're looking at? They are all, um, they all have very different scopes and missions. Um, faith is a common thread okay. for all of them. Um, but that's pretty much it. You've got, you know, people that work with homeless. Um, you know, you could go down the list. It's, it's pretty much everything. Okay. And so their goal of coming together is so they can collaborate on a, num a set number of initiatives that are sort of in the this, this social sphere? Yeah, and it's not even really a set number, really. It's, okay. it's more about, you know, what is it that you're working on? What is it that I'm working on? How might we collaborate? 
Okay, okay, that's really helpful. How might we collaborate? And you said there were, I'm sorry, how many did you say there were 100 some odd? 125. 125. All right. And they're all from different organizations. Correct. Yeah. Okay. There, there may be onesie twosies, but yeah. Okay. So I would probably draw on, they're from 125 different organizations, but I bet a lot of them are related. So I would actually potentially look at drawing from um, a session I'm doing next week with fortunately only 25 people, mm -hmm. um, which is what about having, you know, tables or stations or whatever where people can self-select to, to, with people who are working on issues kind of similar to them. Mm -hmm. So are they human rights, social justice, environment, animals, and let them go through some different things where maybe they talk a little bit about what are the biggest barriers or challenges we are facing right now? So that's a little bit of the where are we component mm -hmm. and let them collaborate and do some things. Yeah. Then they might talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what's working right now, uh, you know, what's being done, what's working, what's not working. And on the one hand, people could share a little bit about their own programs, which they like to do. But of course, it'll be a little difficult to manage that to make sure they're not like, you know, going on at great length about their own programs, which they all love. Mm -hmm. um, but but that could be a way. And then they might work a little bit about, um, uh, you know, what are some new solutions or new ideas? Are there ways we can partner? So that's kind of keeping them a little bit in their if you will, their issues areas or their, their, you know, their, their topics or whatever. But since you could bring in the open space concept, you could certainly mm -hmm. encourage people to move around to say, yeah. well, you know, over here we have this part of social justice and over here we have that part. You know, if you don't like where you're on one group, go to another group. Or why don't you go to yet another group still and look at how a group that's looking at a totally different issues, what are they facing as barriers? How are they thinking about working together? And does that give you the opportunity to maybe forge some unique and creative partnerships outside your sphere with, with some of these other folks? So those are just some things that sort of, sort of come to mind. I love it. Thank you. Okay. So sort of necking down to what is the one issue that you're focused on? Yeah, that's, that's where yep. I would, that's where I would start. And people are going to enjoy that more. I mean, you can learn from everybody, but mm -hmm. you know, animal people want to talk to animal people. I can tell you right. that. Um, so I, I think that will be a really good platform. And then you can mix it up more as you go on when people feel more comfortable with each other and the process and et cetera, then they might be more willing to step out. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. What else? What other questions or thoughts? And actually, I've been asking specifically uh, for questions. Is there anyone who would like to share any reactions or your own experience? I, again, if we had a longer session, I know there was a lot of expertise in the room, uh, and I'm glad we saw so much of it in the chat. But in addition to any questions, does anyone want to add something or challenge something? I'm, you know, I'm okay. Does anyone want to come from a different perspective? I think we may be down to just the last couple of people, Karen. This I might see. be a good place to, to kind of so. call it quits. I think it's a I think I think we're ready to go to bed, actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, Karen, thank you so much for sharing all of this. I got a lot out of this. I can't wait to go through your slide deck, and uh, you know, I know I'm going to use um, uh, several of your templates that you int introduced. Thank you so much for uh, volunteering your time and uh, for sharing all of this. I'm. I, I can't wait till next time. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for being here and thanks for uh, especially for sticking it out to the bitter end. <laughs> Have a good one. Thank good you. Good night. Bye-bye. So